Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... You may remain seated. Our sermon text was our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 14, which was read just before, and I'll be referring to it throughout the sermon. The grace of Christ be with you all. Amen. Dear servants of our humble Lord and Savior, when I think about learning humility, there's someone, a person from my past who comes into mind. We'll just say his name is Andy because these things have a way of being recorded and passing around our little well circles. Andy went to school with me at our little Lutheran grade school and he was one of those students who knew how to make the teachers cry. The antics that he did in class just disrupted everything and despite their best efforts and consequences that those teachers doled out, there was nothing they could do to stop Andy from misbehaving in class. He was an absolute terror at times. And I dare say that those teachers were probably glad when he graduated and at least moved on to the next class and, and then on to high school. But then something happened in Andy's life. Immediately after high school, he decided to enlist in the Marines. And I've never been in the Marines. I don't know firsthand what it's like. But uh, the training that you go through, as I understand it, has a way of changing people. And I have to imagine that my grade school teachers smiled as they heard that Andy was going into the Marines. Andy, I think, finally got what he had coming to him. Many of you could probably fill in the details about what basic training is like in the Marines far better than I can. But the hard work that you go through in basic training serves at least a double purpose. It's not just there to make these weaklings into strong men and women. It's not just there to build you up physically and make you mentally stronger for the projects and the tasks and the missions that you're going to have to handle in your time in the service. There's also another purpose in basic training and that is to break you down. They put you through all that hard work and break you down and then build you up and strengthen you mentally and physically. That breaking down is meant to teach you, well, I suppose our military probably doesn't call it humility, but discipline, right? Several years later, Andy came back to his hometown and the change in him was jaw-dropping. He stopped in after school one day to talk to his teachers and he apologized to them, told them he was sorry for the way that he had treated them in class and disrespected them and our teachers being good Christian people of course assured him that they had forgiven him. And then Andy came back the next day dressed in his full military uniform and was, was invited back the next day to speak to the kids in the classrooms that he had sat in about serving in our military and our armed forces. It took the hard work of boot camp to teach Andy humility. And in a similar way, learning Christian humility takes a lot of hard work and discipline. We could even compare it to boot camp in some ways. It just doesn't happen on its own. It's not natural. But when it happens with God's help, it changes our lives completely. Jesus, in our gospel lesson today, was disgusted that the Pharisees he was sitting down with at dinner did not have that humility. He scolded them again and again throughout his ministry, saying things like, Everything they do is done for men to see. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and to have men call them rabbi. 
And these were the people that Jesus was invited over to their house to eat with them. And Luke tells us very clearly, at that meal he was being carefully watched. They were hoping that he would make some mistake, that he would say something that was wrong, that they could take then to the authorities and accuse him and get him tried. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, we know in this section of Scripture, possibly for the very last time where he would be then arrested by his enemies, tried at this false trial, and eventually hung on the cross and crucified. To describe the humility that his enemies, the Pharisees, lacked, one time Jesus told that parable, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, two men going up to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee stands up and he boasts, oh Lord, I I thank you that I'm not like these uh, other people around me here, all these sinners, these prostitutes, and and especially this, this tax collector here. But the tax collector stayed back at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. Instead, he beat his breast and asked God to have mercy on him because he knew he was a sinner. See, the opposite of Christian humility is not just pride, but self-righteousness. Thinking that we are better than someone else, that we are deserving of God's love, more so than someone else because their sins are more obvious to us than our own. Getting rid of that self-righteousness in our hearts takes a lot of work. We need first to be broken down. By nature, we love nothing more than ourselves. In fact, by nature, we feel that everything that's good means it helps us and things that are bad are things that drag us down. And that's why hearing that we are not righteous but deserving of God's wrath and punishment is such a heavy blow to our sinful natures and our sinful self-righteousness. Have you thought about the words you just confessed earlier in our worship service today? You said, I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve God's punishment both now and eternity. That means every day of your life, you admit that you have not lived up to the perfect standard that God sets. In fact, you have done the things that he says are evil and you have not done the things that he says are good and for your sins, for your crimes against him, you deserve for God not only to take away the temporal blessings, the joy and the, the things that he provides you for your daily life, but also for him to take away your eternal blessings as well. Think about what you're saying when you confess those words. Our self-righteous pride pops up in our hearts and it does so naturally and it says, I'm doing all right on my own. I'm pretty good. I don't really think I deserve for God to punish me in hell for all eternity. That might have been who I used to be, but look at me now. Look at how well I'm doing. God's law squashes our righteous pride though, our self-righteous pride and says, If you claim to have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. God reminds us, the wages of even just one sin is death. And that's why it's important for us to hear God's law and gospel regularly, every single day if possible. We need to hear that truth that reminds us again and again, you are not meeting God's standards on your own. You are not doing well enough. You are not good enough. And I know our world around us wants to tell us how good we are and how wonderful we are and how the basic nature of humanity is good. But God says differently. He says you and I deserve his wrath and punishment. When your sinful nature is telling you you're doing all right, God's law says, no, you're not. And you need someone else to fix this for you. You cannot pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. He breaks us down and breaks down our sinful self-righteousness with his law. But after we've been broken down, then comes the good news, the building back up again. God builds us up, though not as we were, enemies of his. He builds us up as his new children, dearly loved children, made 
again in his image, the creatures that God wants us to be, that he made Adam and Eve to be in the beginning of creation. If the opposite of Christian humility was finding righteousness in ourselves, then Christian humility means finding our righteousness in someone else, in Jesus Christ. And he began that work of giving us his righteousness thousands of years ago when he came into this world to be born as a baby. He lived the perfect life every single day of his life, never incurring God's wrath or punishment, never deserving God's wrath and punishment, not even one single time. But rather than accepting the glory that he rightfully deserved for his perfect life and for who he was as God's own son, he instead gave that all up, instead took your punishment that you deserve and my punishment that I deserve for every one of my sins and bore the brunt of God's wrath on the cross, suffering the temporal and eternal punishment for you and for me. By dying, he won for us the righteousness that we so desperately need. And then through his word now, God comes to work in your hearts. Through the power of his Holy Spirit and through baptism, he has planted faith in your heart and daily strengthens that faith. He comes to us in his body and blood through the Lord's Supper to build you up, to assure you of that forgiveness and that righteousness that is yours as a free gift as well as the home that you have to look forward to in heaven. Becoming a humble Christian does take a lot of work. But you know what? The hard work has all been done for you already by Jesus on the cross. Since that is the way that we received our righteousness as a free gift, it really doesn't make any sense for us to take pride in our righteousness or even in the good things that we do. Jesus, in our gospel lesson, used the illustration of a wedding banquet. My family and I were at a wedding just yesterday. Can you imagine being at a wedding at the beautiful head table up front with the the bride and groom and their wedding party sitting up there? Can you imagine someone trying to go up before the meal starts and, and taking a seat right there in the best man's seat? How embarrassing when the, uh, Bride and groom, or maybe one of the attendants, has to come up and say, Ah, this seat isn't for you. Would you please go pick out a seat down there? There may be times in our lives when we have been foolishly filled with pride in ourselves and the things we do. You maybe know the saying, Pride goes before the fall. And it's true that God may at times allow us to fall flat on our faces when we've begun to be filled with self-righteous pride in ourselves and what we've accomplished instead of what he has done. As Christians, we don't demand praise and recognition from anyone, from our, our peers, from our God in heaven for what we have done. We recognize that we have only done our duty when we follow God's commands. But still, people around us will see it when we live our humble Christian lives of service the way that God has commanded. Because we are saved by Christ's sacrifice for us, now God commands us not to earn our own salvation, but to give our lives as a sacrifice to serve others. See, we don't need to seek glory and honor for ourselves the way the people of this world around us do because you and I have already been given more glory and honor from God in heaven above than anyone else on this earth could ever give us. We don't need for others to look at us and find value in the, the things that we do and, and, and claim that we're good because of those things because God has already looked at us and given us his stamp of approval because of Jesus' righteousness in our place. You don't need to get your name on a plaque on the wall for washing the most dishes at church or serving the, the most homeless people with food 
because our Lord already says, well done, good and faithful servant. We can selflessly serve others and our Lord, demanding nothing in return, giving ourselves and giving up our personal preferences for him and for those around us because we know that everything about us that is praiseworthy, it comes from him. It's a gift from him. Taking the lowest place then means putting others ahead of ourselves. As Paul tells us, in humility consider others better than yourselves, following the example of Jesus our Savior in Philippians chapter 2, and then sitting back in the lowest place, perhaps even watching others take praise and recognition from others, we can smile. Because we know that no matter where we are seated at God's banquet table, he has a special place for us in his heart. He recognizes the good that we do and praises the deeds that others don't even see or recognize. And when we serve one another in this way, in true Christian humility, it makes families and relationships and Christian churches function much better in the way that God intended. See, God made every single one of us differently. He didn't make a single person here the exact same. He didn't give any of you the exact same same gifts in the same amounts. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 describes us as different members of God's church, as different parts of the body of Christ. It's easy for us when we're gathered in a group like this to start looking at certain people and saying, well, their job is more important than my job or his job is more important than her job and the role that, that she plays is more important than than his role, and we start putting value on each other that way. But looking at our roles and responsibilities in church and family and relationships that way destroys our Christian humility and is not what God intended. See, God gives greater glory to those parts of the body that we think aren't quite so glorious. He wants us all to work together, and he has combined the members of bodies, whether those are families or relationships or churches, giving us the different blessings that we need as a group so that we work together and build each other up. Then you know, as you look at the other roles that other people are playing around you, that no matter what the world tells you the value of that role or that role is, you know that the person who takes out the trash or cleans the bathrooms because she loves the Lord and the person who serves communion because he loves the Lord are equally valued and praised by our Father in heaven. Both are equally pleasing to God and both will be equally praised by him on the last day for their services of love and humility to the Lord and to their fellow man when we understand this and when we live according to this truth, then we will function together seamlessly as one body. Then we grow together building each other up as each part does its work. Jesus' words here about being rewarded in eternity remind me of another person from my past. This lady was uh, the mother of my best friend through high school. And she was one of those salt-of-the-earth Christians, just downright wonderful people. She was one of the most humble and yet most joyful people I've ever met in my life. She raised a family of eight kids, which I think in and of itself deserves a badge of honor. And thankfully, all those children got to see her before she passed away of brain cancer. And when their children came to see her, no doubt they, they all shared with her their thankfulness and their love for all that she had done for her. Just think of all the sacrifices that mothers make for their children as they're raising them up, especially raising them to know the Lord. And I'm sure those thanks that she heard from her children meant a lot to her. The praise that they gave her, she loved more than anything. But that praise and that thanks does not even compare to the heavenly reward that she is receiving right now from our heavenly Father above. 
All those little things she did out of love for her Lord and for her family, her neighbors, her children, and even the friends of her children who tagged along and came home and ate their food like me, God has rewarded her in heavenly glory beyond her wildest dreams. May we all, with our eyes fixed on that heavenly glory that God has promised to us, live so humbly to serve our Lord and serve one another. Amen. Please stand. May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times, like us on Facebook, or visit our website for audio and video sermons, or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.